Hi, I'm Misty Jesse, and I welcome you to our Growing in the Word Gospel of Luke online series. Today's presentation is on Unit 5, in which we will cover chapters 15 through 19. Before we begin, let's take a moment to clear our thoughts and open our minds and heart to the Word of God as I begin our study with prayer. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together in this time and place. Be with us now. Bless us with the presence of the Holy Spirit, guiding us on our journey to understand the meaning of your word in our lives today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Chapter 15 consists of a series of parables and lessons dealing with the sinners and their chance of salvation. We find three parables being grouped together, um, all of which focus on valuables lost and found. The central figure in the parables um, is Christ, and, and the person or the object that is lost is the sinner. The first parable, the parable of the sheep, the and, and this is taking a place around table fellowship, um, the Pharisees and the scribes are complaining about tax collectors and sinners, and the fact that Jesus is eating with them. And Jesus, um, to understand that concern, is that uh, in that particular society, um, what one eats and who one eats with are important in maintaining social boundaries. And we find Jesus crossing those boundaries repeatedly. So Jesus responds to their questions and their challenges with the parable of the lost sheep. Let's take a moment to read the parable of the lost sheep. So we're on chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. The tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to him. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon his arrival home he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Now, it's an intentionally exaggerated story with the shepherd leaving 99 sheep in search of one stray. It's also uh, a little absurd to invite neighbors to celebrate the return of the lost sheep. In, In other words, it's not something that would normally take place in society. So what the parable is doing, though, is teaching the extent of God's love for his creatures with these extremes and these exaggerations. And it's pointing to a love so strong that it includes the sinners, which is a concept um, hard for the self-righteous, such as the Pharisees and scribes, to understand. We have this incredible joy in finding one lost sheep, and it's so great that the joy spreads to heaven. Again, the emphasis is on the welcome of the repentant sinner to God's kingdom. Now, traditionally in society at that time, shepherds were boys, girls, or women, and um, the shepherd figure is Christ. Here we have a a shepherd and his flock in the Judean uh, desert, the stories that we're, they're, we're looking at in this series of parables, um, they're focusing on what's lost, finding, followed by a celebration at the finding. And Jesus' table fellowship, um, his practice at these table fellowship is one which um, mirrors that joy and festivity that's very char- characteristic of, of God and being in God's kingdom, which is in sharp contrast to the mumbling and the grumbling that we find among the Pharisees and the legal experts. 
we have another picture with the shepherd and the flock. Um, and, you know, Jesus, we have always moving to where the action is. He's not keeping himself in safe places. He's in the midst of controversy. In other words, a ministry that doesn't challenge or create change isn't, isn't going to give us a really strong um, response. So you have to have a strong call uh, in order to have a strong response. Um, if there's little truth uh, in what's being uh, spoken out there, um, it's not going to have the power to effect change. The next parable is that of the lost coin. And in this scene, it's one of a woman who's searching for a lost coin among 10. Now, the coin most probably is the denarius, which was one day's um, wage for a laborer. And the woman in this parable of the lost coin, she is the Christ figure. And you see her intense desire to find that lost coin. And when she finds it, it's by uh, the response is this immense joy. Um, and so, again, it reflects um, what Jesus is teaching, um, God's desire to find the lost sinner is very intense. And then there's great joy when he brings um, that sinner back into the kingdom of God. Uh, in this picture of an ancient Syrian stone house, um, Syrian stone, stone houses would have been made of very dense and heavy basalt type stone, it, which would be unlike what you find in a typical Galilean house. Um, they're made of lighter sandstone or dried bricks, um, and they're often um, much lighter and brighter. And so the details in the parable, such as that, you know, the building of the house, tell us um, and reflect again on Luke's unfamiliarity with the land of Israel itself. So here we have an example of an, of an ancient Israelite house. Um, uh, normally you have the dried bricks and then um, they're plastered over. Um, and you can see that there are plenty of windows in the house um, providing you know, ample light. The Roman um, denarius is pictured here. Um, numinis, numinismatics is the study of coins. Um, and it tells us, a lot about the propaganda that's taking place in the era. Um, and it's also used for um, dating surrounding structures. Like in this coin, um, you can see the image of the ruler. Um, and on the back, you can see the power that's being exemplified. Most of the time during the Old Testament, uh, precious metals were measured by weight um, and they weren't uh, made into coins yet. Um, the first uh, coinage actually came about, uh, they believe, in Western Anatolia, which would be modern-day Turkey today, probably in the 7th century BCE. Um, and then the use of coinage actually expands during the Persian Empire, and it, and it became standardized. So kings and emperors realized, you know, you can do, you can do a lot of coinage. It's a, it's a great way to spread propaganda, remind the people um, who's in charge. Um, so it was, it was a great tool for, for the leadership. Um, this coin comes from the time period of the Bar Kokhba revolts, uh, and it's dated to 132-135 Common Era. Um, and these coins were actually introduced into Jerusalem around the, um, you know, that 5th century um, before the Common Era uh, BC. Um, Jewish rulers um, did not put uh, their faces on coinage. In fact, they considered it to be a form of idolatry. So you don't see any faces here. Instead, you see the images of the horn and a leer. Um, there's a variety of co coinage that's being uh, distributed during this era. And so there's a lot of inconsistency in their weights. Um, and so that made um, the necessity of a money changer um, to help value and determine, you know, exactly what that coinage was, because they also used different metals within the coin.
In the third parable of the series, the younger son asks his father for his share of inheritance. So we have the parable of the prodigal son. Um, so it's very disrespectful for a son to ask for inheritance from his father um, before his death. It's like asking for the father's life. So this would have really caught the attention of the audience and made them gasp. Um, because it's actually up to a father to decide whether the son deserves a share or not. So the parable reveals the son's attitude. It's one of entitlement. Now, in contrast, the father, instead of taking offense, actually agrees and, and gives his son his inheritance. And then the son turns around and squanders all of his inheritance and ends up living with the pigs because he's starving. And that's the only kind of work that he can find. Now, even the Gentile God-fearers living to, listening to the story understand and, and appreciate Jewish laws in regards to clean and unclean animals. So they understand the imagery as being pretty horrific to have a Jew ending up in a, in a pig pen. So to feed a pig actually goes against everything Jewish. Um, so, but this, this son is, is so desperately hungry um, and willing to eat their food, uh, it's unimaginable that he's managed to get himself into this state. So the situation of the son also shows he's been completely alienated from his, from his community. Now, the son returns to his father, um, you know, in desperation and in, in acknowledgement and acknowledges his sinfulness. And the father, what's the father's response? He doesn't turn away from his son. He doesn't disown him. Instead, he's overjoyed to have his son back, no matter that he's lost his inheritance. The father, he has never stopped loving his son, and it's a love that exceeds all bounds. Now, remember, this was the younger son. Now, the older son, the elder brother of this boy, uh, who's been very obedient and respectful to the father, now gets upset. Um, he actually cites all of his own virtues and he doesn't understand why the father's doing this, but the father then has to defend his own act of forgiveness, and then he has to rebuke, uh, correct the older older brother. The father insists that the prodigal son is a son to him and a brother to his other son. So the son who had been alienated is now restored to the family. Let's take a look at this parable. We're going to read um, verses 25 through 32 in chapter 15. So we're on chapter 15, and we're looking at verses 25 through 32. Now, the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf, because he has been back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours, but now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. We have the elder son. He's so blind um, and he's so jealous um, that he doesn't see the generosity and mercy of his father. As the older son, he should support and respect um, his father's wishes, but he resists them. So now we have the positions are reversed. It's the older brother who's insulting and who's acting disrespectfully, while the younger one has humbled himself. The father's forgiveness and charity is maintaining ties to both his sons. So in this series of three parables, that which is lost increases in value, the lamb, the coin, and the son. And the worth of the sinner increases in God's eyes. The listener of these stories is left with an understanding that God loves all, just as parents love their children. 
In those first two parables, the shepherd and the woman are the Christ figure. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father, the Christ figure or God is the father. The items that the father had dressed the prodigal son with upon his return include a robe, um, sandals, and a signet ring. And these are signs of position and status in the ancient world, the robe, sandals, and the signet ring. Um, a young goat is actually less expensive than a fattened calf. And meat is, in, in, at that time, especially upon the poor people, uh, is generally rarely eaten. It's, it's very expensive and is kept for special occasions. Slaves generally wandered around barefoot. Here's an example of an ancient sandal, which the father provided for his returned prodigal son. And he dressed him in a new robe. And, and long robes were signs of, of distinction. And so he's given him special honor intentionally. In the parable of the dishonest steward, let's take a look at that word stewardship. Stewardship comes from steward. Um, and a steward was the sty warden or the keeper of the pigs. So in that pagan agrarian culture, a man's wealth um, consisted of his pigs. As a result, they needed watchmen over them all the time. And as time progressed, that term steward became associated with anyone with wealth or property that you would entrust them to. So a person that would be entrusted with um, wealth or property. Stewards made their living then collecting rents and debts for their masters and also charging debtors interest on the amount they owed. They also, on the side, frequently lined their own pockets. In this story, the steward is dishonest and the master knows this. And the steward realizes he's being dismissed and he's quite clever. Uh, he hopes to win the favors of the debtor, so he makes these different exchanges. The master becomes impressed with the steward's cleverness. So we see the extremes to which the steward is willing to go to garner favor, and that's what Jesus is pointing to. So any one of us will go to extreme lengths to secure a place in the world. Some of us, hopefully most of us, honestly, some of us dishonestly in which case um, we're spending even more efforts, it's teaching us, to, to find a place in the world to come. Dishonest wealth points to the danger in um, being attached to worldly goods. And, and we've had Jesus' sayings and parables on this subject before. So Jesus warns against placing trust in wealth. He wants us only trusting in God. That's what's going to lead to the eternal dwelling place. A steward who can't manage small matters, then, would not be trusted with big issues. So trust is something you earn. It's not assumed. If you act unethically with others, don't expect honor or trust in, in return. The parable also teaches to be wise in using one's material goods, particularly in light of the coming judgment. Jesus is warning against the attraction of mammon in light of God. And mammon is a Greek word for an Aramaic term, meaning more than just money or wealth. So it's not just monetary, but it's something even greater than that, but with material connotations. It refers to anything that takes our attention away from God, who is the true source of life. The Pharisees' uh, response to this uh, Jesus' parable is to sneer at him, um, this, this concept of the emphasis on the love of money. And Jesus assures them that despite what they attempt to portray in public, God knows and is aware of their inner selves, and they're going to be held accountable for their behavior. Jesus cites the Mosaic Law as we move quickly into the subject of law and divorce. He doesn't 
um, deny or replace the law, the commandments of Moses. If anything, he's even more stringent about its interpretation. It's difficult to accept the revelations of Christ. It, it's presenting a new way to experience and understand a relationship with God. And it proves challenging for the Jewish Christians to change their adherence, their loyalty to the Mosaic law to following Christ's revelations. Now, some of the Gentile Christians are, are not being welcomed into the new faith community of Luke, um, you know, that early Christian community. And they're, they're having um, to undergo conversion to Judaism first, um, before they will be allowed into this new sect. And sometimes um, that actually puts them at risk with their pagan neighbors when they find out. Luke's gospel is stressing that Jesus is the one that has the final say on any interpretation of the law. Mosaic law allows a man to divorce his wife by simply signing a statement of dis dismissal. You know, women didn't have that same choice. And as a result, if a man would do this to a Jewish wife, um, both her and the children would find themselves literally out on the streets. They'd have to fend for themselves and they'd have nothing. Um, and so they'd be left begging for food or prostituting themselves to survive. So Jesus is nullifying this law and he's standing up and protecting the rights of women and children. You can't simply divorce a woman because you didn't like her cooking, you don't like the way she dresses, the way her hair is. Um, they can't be um, these nonsens nonsensical uh, reasons for grounds of divorce, which apparently is what was taking place. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, we have that theme of reversal and uh, a showcase of uh, implementing social justice. So we have Lazarus living in extreme poverty. He has no clothes. He's covered in sores which the dogs lick, and he's very unclean. He's lying by the door of this very rich man. And the rich man um, whose door Lazarus is lying by uh, symbolizes everything that's opposite. His garments are purple and linen, so he's very, very wealthy. So Lazarus, starving, is laying by that door, hoping to receive scraps of food. So he's the exact opposite of the rich man. Eventually, both Lazarus and the rich man die. And Lazarus, we are told in the parable, he's carried to heaven in the arms of Abraham. But that rich man, he's sent to the netherworld, where he's tormented ceaselessly. So we have him crying out to Abraham to also let him go to heaven, to come carry him to heaven, but he's refused. So we have this theme of a great reversal. I mean, it's a very contrast type of a reversal, one in which the hungry are being filled with good things and the rich are being sent away empty. Now, the rich man knows Lazarus. He uses his name. The rich man who's in a very bad condition still doesn't get it. Here he is burning away in the netherworld, and, and he has the audacity to command Abraham to send Lazarus down to refresh him. Now, Abraham's response makes it really clear to the rich man exactly why he is where he is and that he's going to stay there. The cause of the judgment is the rich man's lack of charity and responsibility. It's that sin of omission which has created the great divide. So Jesus is showing the role we each play in our own salvation. The rich man was blind to the needs of others around him while alive, and he's still blind even when he's dead. That par The parable is highlighting for us the danger of wealth, and that's what Jesus has warned us about several times now. A reminder that power and wealth blind us to the kingdom of God in this life and also in the next. We're on chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 27 through 31 and how wealth and power blinds us to those in needs around us. Chapter 16, verses 27 through 31. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them 
lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. So here we have the scene of Lazarus being licked by the dogs, sitting at the gate of the rich man, Lazarus, the rich man. A theme of reversal. The temptation to sin. Now, we're looking at those different temp um, temptations, and Jesus is addressing the sinful behavior in the church community and beyond. So before I open this up, let's move into chapter 17 and take a look at verses 1 to 4 and what he's teaching his disciples. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 4, and and for the early church, this is um, very poignant. It's, it's right on task, apparently, because um, of the issues that they're experiencing. He said to his disciples, Things that cause sin will inevitably occur, but woe to the person through whom they occur. It would be better for him if a millstone were put around his neck and he be thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he wrongs you seven times in one day and returns to you seven times saying, I am sorry, you should forgive him. It's a great sin to lead one into temptation. And so Jesus is warning that the punishment is going to be very severe, even greater, can you imagine, than a millstone around one's neck. And that would make sense to this agrarian society who is very familiar with the use of a millstone because they use it regularly to ground grains into flowers. Now, realizing that there is going to be sin with the, within the community, he's also teaching them about forgiveness and that it's important to provide mercy to the sinner with the understanding that mercy is, per, is not permission to do more harm. Those who sin are going to be warned or punished, and if they repent, they are to be forgiven. The gospel is teaching that rebuking and forgiving allow for personal salvation and also for social justice. So Jesus addresses is addressing the reality of human frailness. He knows that we're going to sin. Um, human sins or specific sins, they can occur repeatedly. And for this, Jesus is telling us we have to forgive. We have to forgive each time a sinner repents. And it's a reminder that divine forgiveness is limitless. Jesus continues his teachings on faith um, as we move into this little um, period here where he talks about the mulberry. And this time, instead of using his previous example about the mustard seed, he now compares faith to a mulberry. The point being that nothing is impossible to the person who has faith. Then the emphasis on faith observes the proper attitude of God's servants or disciples. Let's take a look at what is that proper attitude of faith. So we're on chapter 17, and we're looking at verses 7 through 10. Who among you would say to your servant, who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here immediately and take your place at table? Would he not rather say to him, Prepare something for me to eat. Put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink. You may eat and drink when I am finished. Is he grateful to that servant because he did what was commanded? So should it be with you. When you have done all you have been commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what we were obliged to do. We learn that 
Christians shouldn't expect praise and honor for performing duties they are obligated to perform. So salvation, we're taught again, cannot be earned on human merit alone. It, it's, it's by God's grace that we earn salvation. This is a millstone. So look how big it is and heavy. So imagine having that, um, you know, that imagery that that's something is even greater than that around your neck. The cleansing of the of the ten lepers. In the ancient world, leprosy referred to skin ailments such as boil, rashes, eczema, things like that. Not necessarily the leprosy that we know. It could also refer to that, but it was more commonly a term referring to these general skin ailments. And once healed, an individual would then have to go back, show themselves to the priest, um, be closely inspected, and then declared healed. And then they'd go through purity rituals, and finally they'd be allowed back into the community. And this we find specifically outlined in the book of Le Leviticus in the Old Testament. In fact, for those of you that are interested, you can find it in Leviticus chapter 14, verses 2 through 9. Now we're looking at the, the setting of the scene. Um, and something to note is that the most common route for Jews in Galilee going to Jerusalem is through the Jordan Valley. So the ten leopards um, actually consist of both Galilean Jews and Samaritans. They're outcasts in society. So as a result, they end up associating with each other. And we have this group of 10 lepers calling out to Jesus, um, uh, and both Jews and Samaritans. So it's a very striking scene that follows um, and when we look at faith within the social context. So we're on chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 12 through 19. Chapter 17, verses 12 through 19. As he was entering a village, this is Jesus, 10 lepers met him. They stood at a distance from him and raised their voice, saying, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And they were going, they were cleansed. And one of them, realizing he had been healed, returned glorifying God in a loud voice, and he fell at the feet of Jesus and thanked them. He was a Samaritan. Jesus said in reply, Ten were cleansed, were they not? Where are the other nine? Has none but this foreigner returned to give thanks to God? Then he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has saved you. Jesus' response to that grateful Samaritan is to point out that it is his faith that saved him. This separate leper was saved from disease, and he also received eternal salvation, all due to his faith. Again, it's through faith that we receive salvation. Jesus is looking for a similar response from the disciples. But so far, the examples of faith that Jesus is looking for are like from the leper, the, the good Samaritan, the foreigner, the widow, the tax collectors, and little children. Remember, at least one of those 10 um, lepers is a Samaritan. So we see that Jesus' ministry is crossing all boundaries. He's the only one that, that came back and thanked Jesus. And so his healing is going to remain. It's faith-based. We now focus on the coming kingdom. So the language and the imagery that we see is um, very apocalyptic, in times language. Um, the message is one of being prepared, being ready. Who will be saved? Who will be damned? And the message is filled with a sense of urgency. It's a reminder that people should be vigilant. Any desire to hold on to the present is discouraged. There's um, a warning. Jesus gives a warning against false prophets being prepared for the coming end times, a very strong sense of urgency, and, and you never know when this is going to happen. And then you have that theme of reversal again, social justice, who's going to be saved, who's going to be left behind. 
um, the emphasis on not holding into um, unexpected um, material things, you know, useless material things, because they're not going to do you any good. You can't take them with them. We're supposed to do the will of God, be obedient and be ready, take care of the poor, trust in God, forgive our enemies. We're on chapter 17. Uh, take a look at verse 31, chapter 17, verse 31. So you get a sense of who's going to get left behind and that sense of urgency. On that day, that coming, um, coming of the kingdom and the son of man, a person who is on the housetop and whose belongings are in the house must not go down to get them. And likewise, a person in the field must not return to what was left behind so you just have to be ready because you're not going to have an opportunity um, to do anything about it you're going to be the term you'll find the evangel evangelicals using for this kind of a scene is to be raptured away so here's a typical rooftop found in many places of the middle east because you're probably wondering why is the person on the housetop but their roofs were flat top and they use them to store items, to dry fruit, and to sleep on them on hot nights. So that reference to don't go back in the house to get your belongings would make sense to the audience that's listening to the urgency of being prepared, being vigilant. So here's a scene from common day um, Israel, what you would expect to see on um, the house rooftops. Another sense of that urgency um, with the grinding stone. So look at uh, chapter 17, verse 35. And there will be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken and the other left behind. Again, um, as he uses language um, and images that would be familiar to his audience, the emphasis being on the urgency to be prepared. Don't wait for the last minute to repent. You don't know when I'm coming again. Chapter 18 opens with the parable of the persistent widow. So let's take a look at chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Then he told them a parable about the necessity for them to pray always without becoming weary. He said, there was a judge in a certain town who neither feared God nor respected any human being. And a widow in that town used to come to him and say, Render a just decision for me against my adversary. For a long time the judge was unwilling, but eventually he thought, While it is true that I neither fear God nor respect any human being, because this widow keeps bothering me, I shall deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. The Lord said, Pay attention to what the dishonest judge says. Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The parable has several themes. One is that theme of prayer. Prayer and praying is actually mentioned over 30 times in Luke Acts. So both those combined books together. So before us, we have this image of the persistent widow. We have an example of the importance of prayer and um, the cons and that consistent prayer is very powerful. And that widow is part of that social justice triad that runs through Judaism. Widows and orphans are special recipients of the Jewish law. We find that in um, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 17 through 22, you know, the emphasis on the widow, the orphan, the resident alien. And early Christians, um, most of whom were Jews, would have been aware of this and sensitive to the teaching in this parable. So in ancient Jewish society, the widow would have accepted her faith, but this widow did not. She wasn't going to give up. She's acting out of character. And she astonishes the dishonest judge. And with her persistence, she's forcing him to act justly. So the parable also gives us a, par a comparison of the greater. If that dishonest judge could act justly solely for his personal benefit, 
Imagine how much a loving God will respond to our faithful and persistent prayers. And I'm sure many of you have experienced the power of prayer. Um, That's where miracles take place. This parable um, of the persistent widow is only found in Luke. Um, and, And so we have Jesus teaching by word and by his own example to pray constantly while living and working for the kingdom of God. So here we have a scene of the persistent widow with the um, dishonest judge. And we find Jesus's message throughout, um, again, uh, a reminder that God is characterized by, he's he's a compassionate, that father image of God, um, by generous compassion, by care and, and faithful activity on behalf of his God's children. So if a dishonest judge can make an honest verdict, just imagine how God is going to respond to our persistence in prayer. The theme of prayer continues in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The purpose of the parable is not to discourage religious and pious practice, but actually to question the reason why people take on devotional works. So let's take a look at two different kinds of prayer examples. One of the Pharisee versus the tax collector. We're on chapter 18. We're looking at verses 9 through 14. Chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He then addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Two people went up to the temple area to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisees took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself. O oh God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I pay tithes on my whole income. But the tax collector stood off at a distance and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast and prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee is praying to justify himself in the world's eyes, as well as the eyes of God. Versus the tax collector, he knows he's not pious. In fact, in the eyes of his fellow Jews, by working for the Roman Empire as a tax collector, He's considered a traitor. And tax collectors would never be considered pious, holy, or honest. So think of um, Jesus' audience full of Pharisees and scribes and, you know, tax collectors and sinners listening to this. Now, unlike the Pharisee, the tax collector knows his sinfulness. So he's pleading for mercy and he's demonstrating his need for God. In contrast, the Pharisee, he's just singing his own praises and Um, making God his beneficiary. The end result, Jesus teaches, is that the tax collector is the one to leave justified by God. He's going to receive salvation. The parable is shocking to the audience of Jesus, and it continues to have the same effect on, on the audience today when we listen to this. Jesus is condemning the self righteous. He's teaching that the fundamental attitude of a disciple is the ability to recognize their sinful state and to turn to God for mercy and salvation. The true model of prayer is found in the tax collector and not in the Pharisee. So the the parable is, is again one of reversal. So here we have Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, the priesthood was entrusted to the Levites, that's Aaron, um, and we found that during the story of Exodus. Uh, but during the time of Solomon, uh, the high priesthood uh, then began to belong to the family of Zadok, which was a Levitical family. That house of Zadok is the name from which the Sadashi comes from, and it actually controlled that office of the priesthood until 174 BCE. Then what happened was that the priesthood began to be bought 
Um, and that took place under the Seleucid king Antiochus IV, who controlled Judea. So you had a shift away from hereditary succession, which created a lot of, of tension now, um, as it moved into political and something that was tied with money. The Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid dynasty um, resulted in the Hasmonean family being established as a clan of the priest king, but they weren't um, actual descendants of David or the, um, of the Zadoks. From the time of Herod the Great to the end of the Second Temple period, which was 70 CE, there were 20 different high priests appointed the longest reigning being Caiaphas, um, which, will, which is the one that was present during um, the time of Jesus' um, prosecution and then his crucifixion. The high priest office has a lot of great prestige and influence. It also served as the president of the Supreme Judiciary Council, the Sanhedrin. So it was full of all these very high-class aristocratic families. But as you can see, it's moved far away from the from Aaron, uh, who was the brother of Moses, and um, the tribe of Levi, who were set aside to be priests of God. Now, first century religious life is centers around the temple. Um, there were, you know, uh, so it's very much focused on um, the the politics, apparently, of this religious ruling class who Jesus is coming up against repeatedly in controversies and growing tensions. Access to the kingdom. Luke's gospel tells us that people were bringing um, infants to Jesus. Now, in the sociological structure of the ancient world, conversions were not individualistic. In other words, if the master or the mistress um, of a household converted, that meant the entire household also converted, and that included the extended family and the slaves. Now, accepting the kingdom of God like a child was to receive the kingdom of God with the innocence of a child, a gift that God offers to each of us. Now, for adults, this acceptance requires uh, you know, quite a bit of maturity uh, such as that that was exhibited by that tax collector. So in this reference to accepting like, um, you know, that uh, infants that were brought to Jesus, um, we see that in Luke's gospel, um, most likely by that time, infant baptisms were taking place in the early church. Um, that exponential growth of the early church after um, the death and resurrection of Jesus uh, also had to do with the way people converted, because if the master of the house um, in whole towns and whole cities would convert, um, declared they were going to become Christians, everybody became Christians. Um, but again, the way to faith is like that pure, trusting, unquestioning innocence of a child. A rich official asked Jesus a question about entering the kingdom, and he addresses Jesus as the good teacher, which Jesus finds offensive. The official is very rich and powerful. And his fault is one of complacency. So he's trying to use flattery by referring to Jesus as the good teacher. Um, he thinks he can increase his status uh, and then gain entry into this eternal life. He witnesses to himself that um, he's very self-righteous, that he's observed the commandments from his youth, revealing that he's actually forgotten what it means to be in a covenantal relationship um, by showing your trust in God. So Jesus responds, he tells them, well, sell everything you have, give to the poor and follow me. The official, we're told, becomes very sad because he's very rich. And Jesus says, you have to surrender everything of worth in your life. Everything he thought of great value in this life is actually worthless in the next. And so his life, starting from his youth, it's actually been an act of faithlessness. Jesus's point. The rich man needs to trust in God, not in his material possessions. Jesus makes it clear that entering the kingdom is a challenge. It's like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. In that case, they're like, well, then who can be saved? Um, 
The lesson to the wealthy official is similar to that found in the parable of the dishonest steward. In other words, the wealthy official, by trusting his own wealth and accomplishments instead of God, has made his salvation almost impossible. Power and wealth are idols. They're hard to give up. In fact, they're so hard to give up that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. So giving up our worldly comforts, um, the reward will be um, realized in our eternal life. Jesus makes the third prediction of the, of the passion. Um, and in this, he gives plenty of details. This is as he's heading um, into Jericho, that there's no doubt that being a disciple has reward, but also difficulties. This, the disciples still do not understand the prediction of Jesus's impending death. But in contrast to the disciples is this blind beggar who's sitting on the road to Jericho, and he's able to clearly identify Jesus and his role. Jesus and the disciples, again, they're nearing on Jericho when they come across this beggar sitting on the side of the road. So let's take a look at um, the blind beggar. We're on chapter 18. We're looking at verses 35 through 43. Chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Now, as he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He shouted, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. The people walking in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he kept calling out all the more. Son of David, have pity on me. Then Jesus stopped and ordered that he be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He replied, Lord, please let me see. Jesus told him, Have sight, your faith has saved you. He immediately received his sight and followed him, giving glory to God. When they saw this, all the people gave praise to God. As a beggar sitting on the edge of the road, this sets the scene for us and tells us that this man has a very low social position. And yet, of all of those around Jesus, he's actually the only one who truly sees who Jesus is. So the story is one filled with comparisons. The blind man can see Jesus is the Messiah, but his 12 disciples can't understand what Jesus is saying. You know, he keeps giving them the prophecy. The blind man calls Jesus son of David. Clearly, um, that's a Christian title, a very Christian title, and we, a title that we find um, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, which, which he will use repeatedly. But he knows and identifies him as the son of David. The blind, the blind man persistently calls out for Jesus, no matter that the people try to quiet him. So you see that persistence. And so Jesus has the crowd bring the blind man to him. Now, in the ancient world, we've learned that sickness and disability is a sign of sinfulness. By having the crowd bringing the blind man to him, Jesus has made the crowd take responsibility for healing him. And so we have Jesus redefining suffering and sin. The beggar requests sight, and he knows Jesus can give him this, and it demonstrates his faith. In the end, everyone glorifies God both the beggar and the crowd. It's a beautiful story. So here we have, um, he's heading to Jericho. He's uh, come down through Samaria, heading to Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. So here we've got the city of Jericho. Now Jericho is thought to be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world dating back nearly 10,000 years. It's located beyond the northern portion of the Dead Sea, and it's one of the lowest places on earth, in fact, which you know the Dead Sea is, and Jericho is also about the lowest city on earth. It's nearly 800 feet below sea level. The mountains between Jericho and Jerusalem capture water far above Jericho, and then they carry the water through an underground spring called the Ein Es Sultan, or Elijah's Fountain. The fresh water then 
it falls out into the desert oasis and is used for irrigation. So in the midst of this desert, you have this incredible oasis. Even though the surrounding plains are nearly waste and desolate, the abundance of fresh water from that spring in Jericho uh, makes the soil of Jericho one uh, very, very fertile. And the city is celebrated also because it's full of these beautiful palms and palm trees that decorate the landscape. So um, Jericho ends up being a very rich and flourishing town uh, with a lot of, of trade, and it was uh, on the caravan route. Here we have a, um, a tell, which um, is an archaeological name for a site, uh, an, an archaeological excavation site, and this is a tell which covers um, Jericho. A uh, kir bed is another term that's used for archaeological sites, but in the case of a kir bed, the, roots, the ruins are actually visible above ground. You would think of Ephesus as an example of that. So Jericho was built atop uh, a great mound. It was uh, nearly 70 feet high, and that ancient tell is a testament to the site. Um, in, so in, in the ancient days, instead of tearing down an old city, people would just keep building a new one on top of it. And they just keep building new cities in this manner for many generations. So you get this artificial hill, which we refer to as a tell. And archaeologists have actually found a tower standing 25 uh, feet high at the tell in Jericho. The entire city seems to have been fortified by a, uh, numerous sets of walls indicating from various, uh, from the very early times that the city was walled in to protect itself from whatever was out there. And they would actually set the walls on top of each other. These are the ruins of Herod's Winter Palace, which is found at Jericho. Um, at the height of its existence, Jericho was known as the most important city in the Jordan Valley. And so it had the strongest uh, fortress in all that land. It was uh, on, on a route to an important east-west road, making it a very strategic um, entrance point from the Transjordan into the highlands of Judah. The city became very famous um, as it was conquered by Joshua and the Israelites after they were led by God through the wilderness from Egypt. Now, the story of Zacchaeus appears only in the Gospel of Luke. Contrary to Luke's previous emphasis, um, welcoming the poor and the lowly, now he focuses on the salvation of the rich and the powerful. Let's take a look at chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He came to Jericho and intended to pass through the town. Now, a man there named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and also a wealthy man, was seeking to see who Jesus was. But he could not see him because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When he reached the place, Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. And he came down quickly and received him with joy. When they all saw this, they began to grumble, saying, he has gone to stay at the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions, Lord, I shall give to the poor, and, I, and if I have exhorted anything from anyone, I shall repay it four times over. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a descendant of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save what was lost. Unlike the rich official that we had in the earlier in an earlier story, Zacchaeus isn't looking to wealth and status to enter the kingdom, but he's looking to God's love and mercy um, to gain entry into the kingdom. He understands that wealth and power are not going to get him into the kingdom, but only God's loving mercy will do this. Now, tax collecting is a prosperous business, and a chief tax collector who's in charge of an entire district, and I've already told you Jericho would have been very wealthy at that time, is going to be really rich. 
So Zacchaeus is very, uh, very wealthy. In fact, that name Zacchaeus means wealthy. And he's, we're told he's determined to see Jesus. He's very persistent, like the persistent widow. And he's also aware of his wrongdoing. So the story is not about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, but it's all about Zacchaeus, the son of Abraham. Zacchaeus is willing to live a life of repentance. He's determined to see Jesus. And Jesus does what? He restores Zacchaeus to his community, which had excluded him because of his vocation as a tax collector. Remember, I said tax collectors were considered traitors among the Jews. And Jesus points out, he came to seek and save the lost. So salvation has come to Zacchaeus. This is followed by the parable of the 10 coins, the 10 coin, gold coins. So Amina is worth about 100 days wages. And a talent on a talent is 60 times as much. Now, in terms of, of the parable, there's also like a historical subtext in that both Herod and his son, Heraclius, um, were known to have gone, gone to Rome uh, to receive um, ruling, uh, uh, the ability to rule and have the authority over the Holy Land. And so they went to Rome seeking this authority from the Roman emperor. Now, Heraclius is the son of Herod the Great, and he's very cruel. In fact, there were so many complaints in regard to his authority and rule that it actually um, gets removed. Him. He gets removed from that. He's given an area of, of lesser territory to control. So the nobleman in the parable may actually be a reference to Heraclius. So in the parable, three servants are given 10 coins each, and they're commanded to use the money in a way that's going to earn more. The first do to do as they're told, but the third servant is foolish and disobedient and he does nothing. And so the parable provides an example of how to properly use the riches, the gifts God gives us. The gifts given by God are, are supposed to be used to lift up the kingdom, to grow the kingdom. And when well used, they're going to grow the kingdom message as exemplified by those first two servants and how their coins multiplied and grew. Goods not used in a positive way, is such as wrapping them up in a, in a kerchief, um, they're going to be taken away. So that subsex continues in regards to the king and nobleman, because similar to Heraclius, when he was given the authority, um, those that complained about him to Rome, um, they were killed. And in the parable, we were told that the king also slays those that complained about him. So Zacchaeus, in the first parable in this section, uh, climbed up to the top of a sycamore fig tree. So here's an example of that tree. And that reference to ancient gold coins, here are some examples of these ancient gold coins. Um, and they were referred to as minas. Jesus has arrived into um, at the holy city of Jerusalem. So when he arrives there, he's going to teach and experience the passion, which is leading to his death and resurrection. So his teachings now take on a, a very particular type of urgency. So first we have the entry into Jerusalem. Uh, we're told that he's passing through Bethphage and Bethany. They're both on the Roman road from Jericho to Jerusalem. And his passage there um, fulfills the prophecy found in Zechariah chapter 9, 9, which refers to a king riding on a colt or the foal of a donkey. And it's used to set the scene. So he arrives riding on this colt and the masses welcome Jesus at his arrival. They're shouting out Hosanna and um, an, an Aramaic expression, which means save, I pray, save us, I pray. So that entrance and greeting received by Jesus is one that's appropriate for royalty. So we're on chapter 19, ver verses 36 through 38. Chapter 19, verses 36 through 38. A royal welcome. As he rode along, the people were spreading their cloaks on the road. And now as he was approaching the slope of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to praise God aloud 
with joy for all the mighty deeds they had seen. They proclaimed, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He said in reply, I tell you, if they keep silent, the stones will cry out. Luke uses that term, blessed is the king, and uses it to emphasize the nearness of the kingdom of God. What the angels sang at Jesus' birth is now being repeated by the crowds at his arrival in Jerusalem. And the Pharisees who are staged along the road, they're alarmed. They're not quite hostile, but they're definitely alarmed. And Jesus responds to their challenge. Let's keep moving forward. We're looking at chapter 19. We're going to look read now verses 41 through 44. 41 through 44. The Lament for Jerusalem. As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If this day you only knew what makes for peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days are coming upon you when your enemies will raise a palisade against you. They will encircle you and hem you on all sides. They will smash you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another within you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus gives a prophecy as he laments for Jerusalem, and the lament describes the disaster of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 CE. That name, Jerusalem, means peace. However, the city of peace is not going to recognize Jesus as God's agent of peace. And in the end, they're going to suffer the judgment of God. Then we move into the cleansing of the temple. At the temple, business takes place in the court of the Gentiles, which is surrounded by the royal portico. This is an addition that was built during the reign of Herod the Great um, when he expands the temple. And this happens during what we refer to as that second temple period. The merchants in the courtyard are doing their job. The temple court is the area where worshipers move from secular to sacred space because they have to change their pagan money to Jewish coinage and purchase ritually pure sacrificial animals. Remember when I showed you the coins and how they would have changed it into the Tyrian shekel, which doesn't have any idolatrous imagery on it. Now, Jesus is upset um, because he believes that no business should be taking place in God's house except prayer and worship. Instead, the temple has become a source of income for the priests. Many of these priests are actually invested in the shops because the royal portico is lined with shops, which um, you know is backed by the money changers, and they're getting a percentage of that and then um, these animals. And what would happen is that if they came from long distances, their animals would no longer be pure and unblemished or they wouldn't be young. And so then they would trade them for these pure unblemished animals that were provided at the temple. So Jesus, um, and, and, and because the priests are invested in, in all of this, um, they're actually committing injustices against the poor. They're, you know, have very high exchange rates. Um, and so here God has tax, um, has actually tasked these priests, if they, if we go back to the original purpose of the tribe of Levi, um, they were to care and provide <coughs> for the people. But instead, what are they doing? They're charging them exorbitant exchange rates and fees for the items that they need for the sacrifices, um, which is animals, oils, incense, and grains. <clears throat> Jesus displays his authority when he cleanses the temple. And now that he's cleansed it, you know, by overturning the tables and, and saying and, and seeing what he does, it's now become a proper place for his teaching and ministry in, G in Jerusalem, which is going to bring God's message um, to the poor. The, the joyous entry then of that previous day when they were cheering him on as he entered into Jerusalem begins to close on a dark tone, an ominous tone, with the reference of the temple being a den of thieves, which also echoes the words of the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. So tensions mount now because the chief priest scribes and the leaders, were told, began to plot the death of Jesus. And note, Luke doesn't list the Pharisees, 
Pharisees as the ones in the plot to kill Jesus. So he's very specific. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders were told. So here we have Jerusalem. The city of peace and um, the road to Jerusalem. So you, you have the remains of a Roman road um, and they're intentionally rough. You can see the, the markings here and how the steps are done. That's to prevent the animals for slipping and the carts for slipping, particularly when the, the stones become wet. <clears throat> Some imagery of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, riding on a colt again in fulfillment of the prophecies and these are the steps the temple leading up to the temple the remnants of the of what we think where the temple would have been and we can imagine jesus would have stood and actually taught on these temple steps now the temple layout um, includes the court of the Gentiles and the royal portico. So here's the court of the Gentiles, okay, and here we've got the royal portico. So imagine the place is full of shops and shopkeepers and all this milling around and there's noise and commotion and smells, um, the bleeding of the animals and the money changers and the exchanges is going on. So this is what Jesus is seeing as he enters and he's horrified. It's, you know, it's, it goes against everything, especially when you consider, you know, how far some of these pilgrims have traveled to come here and what they're experiencing. Meanwhile, watch now. We have, if you see where I'm pointing my arrow, we have the Antonio Fortress. So um, the Roman authorities uh, are, are, are in the area. They're residing here, keeping an eye on what's taking place in the temple grounds. Why? Um, they're looking for any signs of unrest or rebellion because the income from the temple of Jerusalem, a significant part of it, goes to Rome. And so they want to make sure that everything is running smoothly and they get their monies from here. So they, the guards would be walking along the walls watching what's taking place. So when the disturbance occurs with Jesus overturning the, the, the merchant tables and the money changers tables, um, the chief leaders and the scribes and the Sadducees would be um, would be concerned and upset because they don't want to do anything that's going to ruin their their relationship with the Roman authorities. You know, they're allowed to practice and run the temple. They don't want to do anything to upset it. So, yes, Jesus is now becoming a problem for them and a concern. So here we have the temple wall, a reminder of the fall of Jerusalem, which was prophesied by Jesus. And it took place in 70 CE. Nothing is left except some stone walls as a reminder of it. And here we have that um, example of the shekels. And the importance of, of the shekels. Um, so the connection between the Jerusalem temple and the city of Tyre. Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent cedars of Lebanon, cypress logs, and artisans to Jerusalem to help King Solomon build the first temple. So we have this connection between the city of Tyre and the second temple period in Jerusalem, the Tyrian shekel. Now, every year, a Jewish man, 20 years old um, of age and older, had to pay a voluntary half-shekel temple tax to the Jerusalem temple. And this tax was instituted by Moses. We find that in Exodus 30. And it was paid either in the Tyrian shekel for himself and another person or a half shekel for only himself. The shekel with the laureate head of Heracles is a pagan de uh, deity. And on a verse on the other side, we see that eagle. It's a graven image. And it averaged about 14.2 grams in weight and it contained at least 94% silver. So these coins were minted in tier between 126, 125 uh, BCE all the way to um, 1918 uh, BCE. The rabbis decided that the commandment to give the half shekel temple tax with its proper weight and purity was more important than the prohibition of who or what image was on the coin. So after the Roman government closed the tier mint, these coins actually continued to be minted at an unknown 
uh, at an unknown mint facility. We haven't discovered it, but it was probably somewhere near Jerusalem. And that continued from 18 BCE until 70 CE. So the Jewish coin makers actually continued to strike coins with the image of Heracles and the eagle. And this was very much contrary to the clear teachings of the word of God. Um, and so we have the rabbis declaring that a satyrian shekels are the only legal um, currency that was acceptable, accepted in the temple. So again, um, you can understand why Jesus is, is very upset with what's happening on the temple grounds. It also explains why the Essenes washed their hands of everything in Jerusalem and moved out into the Qumran desert area. Okay, let's take a look at our reflection questions. The first one, what rewards do you expect from God and why? Two, in what ways has God shown mercy to you and your family? Three, in what ways do you exercise faith in Jesus each day? And four, how do you define the kingdom of God? I look forward to you joining us for our final unit in this series, Unit 6. We'll be covering chapters 20 through 24. I want to wish each of you a blessed day. Please join me as we close in the prayer our Father taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.